Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 16, Photosynthesis. In this lesson we'll be examining the structure of chloroplasts and light pigments. Let's first get a perspective on the importance of photosynthesis. Approximately 60 quadrillion grams of carbon are converted to organic chemical compounds each year and the energy to do so comes from photosynthesis. In this process, the energy of sunlight is converted into chemical energy, into chemical compounds. The energy of light is captured and used to produce a proton gradient, very similar to the process of electron transport that we examined in Chapter 15. This proton gradient is then used to drive ATP synthesis, just as in oxidative phosphorylation. The reducing equivalents and ATP generated through the light reactions of photosynthesis are then used to fix carbon dioxide gas into chemical carbon compounds. So which organisms can do this? Well certainly we know that plants can carry out photosynthesis like the sunflowers in the photograph on the lower left but there are also species of bacteria that can utilize this method of generating energy as well. Plants and bacteria like the cyanobacteria pictured on the lower right carry out a form known as oxygenic photosynthesis. That is a process that generates O2 gas. Other species of bacteria carry out a type of photosynthesis that does not generate oxygen, hence anoxygenic, but we will not be examining that process. Let's also put photosynthesis in a larger metabolic context in the figure on the slide. Recall that the last phase of aerobic glucose metabolism was to oxidize the two carbon compound acetyl-CoA through the citric acid cycle to generate as a waste product CO2 gas. Through the process of photosynthesis light energy will be collected and used to transform CO2 gas into a three carbon compound. Photosynthesis takes place in chloroplasts. An electron micrograph of a chloroplast from tobacco is pictured on the left. Note the green color due to the presence of a high concentration of chlorophyll pigments. We'll look at those more particularly in a moment. On the right is a schematic diagram showing the internal structure of a chloroplast. Let's look at that in greater detail. We first notice that the chloroplast has an inner and outer membrane as well as the intermembrane space between them very similar to a mitochondria. The outer membrane is porous and the inner membrane is a typical lipid bilayer. But notice that the size and dimension of the inner membrane is different from that of the mitochondria. You'll notice it is lacking the convolutions or folds of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Recall that the purpose of these folds in the mitochondria was to provide more membrane space in which to embed the electron transport chain in ATP synthase, multiple copies of each, and this allowed us to generate more energy. The lack of these folds in the chloroplast tells us that the components of photosynthesis are not within the chloroplast inner membrane. The fluid the aqueous fluid within the chloroplast is called the stroma and is analogous to the mitochondrial matrix. Look at the figure on the right and you'll notice that there is yet another compartment. There are these stacks or grana of thylakoids. The word thylakoid simply means sac-like, as you can see, an appropriate name for these structures. Since these are small compartments, and there are several stacks of them, this provides much surface area in the thylakoid membranes. This is where the components of photosynthesis and the chloroplast ATP synthase are embedded. Note that though the membrane structure is very different, the same goal is accomplished as in the mitochondrial membrane. Lots of membrane surface area. The most internal area within the thylakoid is the lumen. You'll want to keep these structures in mind as we examine the light reactions of photosynthesis in detail to note the direction of electron flow and the area which accumulates protons. 
In the process of photosynthesis, the energy of light is transformed into a proton gradient. So let's first review the basic principles that relate light to energy. In physics, we learned that energy, E in our equation here, is inversely related to the wavelength of light denoted in our equation as lambda. It is also directly related to the product of Planck's constant, h, and the speed of light, c. This equation tells us that the energy contained in a single photon of light, the smallest packet of light, if you will, depends on the wavelength absorbed. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy that photon contains. At the top of our screen, we see illustrated the spectrum of light from short to long wavelengths. That is from higher energy on the left to lower energy on the right. You'll notice that the high energy light spectrum includes UV light and that infrared light is in the low energy spectrum. Visible light is in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers, and this is sometimes denoted by the acronym ROY G BIV, giving the colors associated with these wavelengths from long to short wavelengths. So what is it that actually absorbs the light energy in this process of photosynthesis? Well, these are the light pigments or photoreceptors. These terms are interchangeable. Some of these are illustrated on the right of our screen. At the top, we have an example of a chlorophyll molecule, in this case, chlorophyll A. Note the familiar porphyrin ring that we saw in myoglobin and hemoglobin, as well as in the cytochromes associated with the electron transport chain. Notice, though, that in this case, the metal ion center is magnesium. That is, it is not a redox metal, the metal serves a different function. As we'll see in a later lesson, the chlorophyll pigments play a direct role in the light reactions of photosynthesis. In the center of the screen, we have a carotenoid, in this case, beta carotene, and on the bottom, we have phycocyanin. Notice that though the structures can vary considerably, they are all highly conjugated. It is the presence of these alternating single and double bonds that gives them resonance and therefore ability to absorb light. Since they absorb light in the visible range, they also have characteristic pigments or colors. The different photoreceptors absorb light of different wavelengths, as illustrated in the figure at the top of our screen. For instance, notice that chlorophyll A and B absorb light of shorter wavelength and therefore higher energy as compared to phycocyanin, which absorbs wavelengths around 600 nanometers, a longer wavelength and lower energy. It is the difference in structure and degree of resonance that has most to do with the wavelength of light absorbed. In our next video lesson, we want to look at some of the possible fates of light energy after it is absorbed and see how the light harvesting complex operates to collect the light used in photosynthesis. This will help us appreciate why we need so many different types of photoreceptors.